Hello and welcome to week two. Uh, this video lecture is about Manifest Destiny and the West. So we're going to look at uh, the idea of moving west and the idea of uh, Native Americans, what happened around the Civil War and after. So let's start first with Manifest Destiny. And I have here two very, very famous American portraits. Um, they both depict the idea of moving west. Um, the bottom one, for example, it's supposed to be Lady Liberty moving towards the west. And you can see all these settlers moving with covered wagons. You can see stagecoaches and you can see trains all moving towards the west, towards the unknown. And then in the top picture, you see all of these, these pioneers moving towards the west and pointing to the west. Now, the big question is, what was Manifest Destiny? And Manifest Destiny was a term used throughout the 1840s going into the 1850s until it disappeared a little bit because of that whole thing called the Civil War. And then it pops up again in the 1870s. Um, the easiest way to explain Manifest Destiny and I always boil it down to just one phrase, and that's, that's God said go west. There was this belief amongst Americans in the 1840s, the 1850s, and even the 1860s that it was the American way, the American ideal to spread the idea of civilization, spread the idea of democracy to um, what they considered savages, the, the native populations, the indigenous people. If you're at all familiar with British history or British literature, you may have heard of a guy named Rudyard Kipling. Um, he wrote something, a poem called Take Up the White Man's Burden. This is the, the American equivalent of that white man's burden, this idea to spread civilization, spread democracy. Now, these American ideals, these Western ideals, they're going to be spread to the native populations whether they want it or not. And Manifest Destiny is why we justify war with Mexico in the 1840s, why we um, justify the persecution and, and removal of Native Americans. And there are many presidents who run on this idea of Manifest Destiny. Uh, William Henry Harrison, who's only president for a little bit, he gets elected on the idea of Manifest Destiny. John Tyler, James K. Polk, even after the Civil War, um, Ulysses S. Grant has a little bit of this manifest destiny in him. A lot of this move west is money driven. Uh, gold is discovered in California in 1848. Silver is discovered in Nevada at almost the same time. Now, how are these people getting to the west coast? Before the Civil War, it's mostly on these overland trails. There's the Oregon Trail the California Trail, and the Santa Fe Trail. And of those three, the Oregon Trail is the most famous. It's the one that has the best video game. The story behind the Oregon Trail, uh, originally the area known as Washington State or Oregon, was disputed between Britain and England. And there's eventually going to be a treaty that gives the Oregon tra uh, Territory to the United States. This is a trail that went from Independence, Missouri, all the way to the Willamette Valley of Oregon. And it was so well-traveled that you can still see parts of it today when you go out west and it's in the drier environment. 1843 alone, there's over a thousand pioneers, there's over a hundred wagons, and over 5,000 cattle that leave Independence, Missouri for a one-way trip to the Willamette Valley. Uh, by the time the Oregon Trail shuts down in the, the late 1850s, uh, there's over 80,000 people who have traveled that way. The California Trail is a little less well-known, but it's equally important. It also started in Independence, Missouri, but it went to California, to the center of California, where most of the gold was being found. The California Trail unofficially existed in the early 1800s, but John C. Fremont comes along in the 1840s, officially maps it out for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and it becomes the official highway, if you will, in and out of California. Most of the people who travel it are going to be uh, gold prospectors, and 
over 250,000 people are going to travel on the California Trail, including the very famous Donner Party. Now, if you've never heard of the Donner Party, um, it's a family of a very wealthy Illinois farmer who loads up more stuff than supplies. And he's originally going to go on the Oregon Trail. And then halfway on the, the trail, he decides, you know what, let's go to California. He gets lost in the salt flats near Salt Lake City finds another group of people, a second group of people who say, oh, we know the way. And then they get stuck in the Sierra Nevada mountains. A freak snowstorm happens and people start eating each other. So at the Donner Party, if you're at all interested in stuff like that, the Donner Party is really interested. D-O-N-N-E-R. Now, the third of these trails is the Santa Fe Trail, and it's going to become the primary route between Mexico and the United States. It went from St. Louis to Santa Fe, Mexico, now Santa Fe, New Mexico. And not only is it the primary trade route, but it's also a route that people took to settle in the southern United States. It's a route people took to settle in Texas, Oklahoma, Mex New Mexico. Eventually, there are going to be these huge cattle farms that are set up in that part of the world and they use the Santa Fe Trail to bring the cattle to market in St. Louis. And St. Louis today is a big meat market as part of this history. Now the big question is where were these people not going? And the place they're not going was the Great American Desert. Uh, we know the Great American Desert today as the Great Plains. So we're talking Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas, Oklahoma, um, Wyoming, places like that. Now, the reason people didn't want to live there is because, for the most part, there are no trees. It's very flat. It doesn't rain as much as you think. I'm sure you've probably heard about all those tornadoes that hit Oklahoma and, and Nebraska and Kansas. But that only happens certain times of the year. The rest of the year the middle of the country is fairly dry. So because of the lack of rain and the lack of trees, it was originally seen as being inhospitable. <clears throat> and because white settlers didn't think that was a good place to go, the Great Plains is going to be where most Native Americans are relocated. You can go back as early as the 1830s with the Trail of Tears. All of those Native Americans being removed from Georgia were being sent to Oklahoma. And that brings me to Indian removals. As early as the 1820s, a Native American removal plan was put into place from places such as Georgia or Virginia. And these Native populations who lived along the East Coast and east of the Mississippi River are going to be moved to Oklahoma they're going to be moved to the Great Plains because that's where people didn't think they could live. But eventually, as the United States grows and as the population grows, even that land that was originally seen as being unnecessary and unneeded becomes coveted. When John Deere invents the steel plow and when Cyrus McCormick invents this automatic machine to harvest wheat, suddenly those places that were inhospitable and nobody thought anything could grow are going to be prime farmland. Now our first treaty to talk about is the Treaty of Fort Laramie. This is a treaty that's going to be signed in Wyoming in 1851 and there are 10,000 Native Americans who meet with U.S. representatives at Fort Laramie, Wyoming and a treaty is going to be negotiated that is to allow wagon trains to pass through Native American territory as these wagon trains go west to California and Oregon. Now, the reason the Native populations did this is they thought it was one of the ways that their way of life and their customs could be preserved. If the U.S. agreed to leave the rest of Native land alone, and just have these highways, if you will, go through, then 
they'd be able to preserve their way of life. Unfortunately, that didn't work, and slowly the native populations start to be rounded up and put onto reservations. Now, life on reservations is not very good. Um, even today, um, the reservations are very harsh. There's poverty, there's starvation, there's confinement. Uh, we're talking like going back in time almost to a colonial society. Um, even today in 2021, uh, reservations have some of the highest poverty re rates and some of the highest alcoholism rates in the country and one of the lowest education rates. Now in 1864, in the month of November, there is an event that happens in Colorado called the Sand Creek Massacre where a local Colorado militia is going to attack without provocation a native tribe where 270 Cheyenne are killed, including children that had already surrendered to the Colorado militia. Native American populations were seen as almost less than human at this time. Continuing from there, in the 1860s and 1870s, there's this systematic killing of bison herds because bison were seen as integral to native populations. If you look at the picture on the top right, those are bison or buffalo skulls. It is a mountain made out of buffalo skulls or bison skulls. Now, there are a couple of reasons for the systematic killing. Number one, with heavy industry from mass production, manufacturing, all those things we talked about last lecture period. Heavy leather is needed for all these industrial usages. On top of that, heavy leather is needed for the production of these more accurate rifles that are being produced. Eventually, the U.S. Army is going to get in on this systematic killing of bison herds in an attempt to wipe out almost the native populations where the industrial killers would at least use the the bison for some use the u.s army would just kill the bison and leave them laying there there are pictures i didn't want to put them up but there are pictures of just bison carcasses laying all over the place if any of you ever get a chance to go to st louis which i highly recommend uh, there is a national park underneath the St. Louis Arch dedicated to some of this um, events that I'm talking about right now. Um, eventually, 1867, there's the Treaty of Medicine Lodge. And the Treaty of Medicine Lodge in 1867 is going to relocate the majority of native populations to reservations while still giving native populations the ability to hunt bison. However, there are not very many bison left. So Native Americans are going to be faced with starvation. They're going to become almost completely dependent on the U.S. government. The situation gets so bad in the 1870s that some of the Native tribes, specifically the Sioux of the Dakotas, are going to rebel against the U.S. Army and against the U.S. government. And the most famous rebellion of this time is led by Chief Little Crow, and you can see his wanted poster right there. And the U.S. Army is going to declare war in, on the, in the 1870s on the Dakota Sioux, on the Black Hill Sioux, on the Comanche, and several other native groups. And then 1868, there's the second treaty of Fort Laramie. This is an attempt to stop the war from happening. Several famous Sioux chiefs are going to sign on to it. Uh, however, the two most powerful, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, are going to refuse to sign. Now, what causes this war to ultimately break out is the discovery of gold in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Uh, if you're not familiar with where the Black Hills of South Dakota are, it's a southwestern part of the state. It's also where Mount Rushmore is located. Now, the discovery of gold is going to bring in thousands of white settlers, even those 
even though there's an agreement to keep white settlers out of there. This is guaranteed territory to the Sioux. Now, the U.S. government asks the Sioux to sell the land. They refuse. And so the U.S. Army removes the Sioux and the Cheyenne from the Black Hills by force. They are moved to the Pine Ridge Reservation. And any of the chiefs, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull included, who refused to go willingly were hunted down. Now, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull they're going to organize a resistance and in 1876 there's going to be a battle between the u.s army and a native army at the battle of little bighorn this is famous because that's where lieutenant colonel george c custer is defeated and killed this is kind of the high point of indian or native american resistance but by 1880 uh, that resistance crumbles because Crazy Horse is killed, Sitting Bull surrenders, and the rest of the Sioux are going to go to the reservations without much reservation, if you will. Now, what's interesting about the Black Hills, the Sioux have sued the U.S. government, and the Sioux have won in the Supreme Court but they're still waiting for payoff and return of the Black Hills to the Sioux people. Now, in the end, there's going to be forced assimilation. There are going to be assimilation schools that are opened where Native American students are going to be forcibly moved, and they're going to be forcibly taught Western-style life. The first of these... Indian schools, as they were called, was open in Pennsylvania. I believe it was New Carlisle, Pennsylvania, if I'm remembering correctly. And Native American children are taken from their families. They're not allowed to speak their, their common or native language. They have to wear Western-style clothes. They have to cut their hair to Western-style fashions. They have to observe Western culture completely. And not only that, but people from different ethnic groups or native populations are joined together so that way they, they can't reinforce their native cultures, their native languages, or native beliefs because not every Native American group had the same native cultures or beliefs or language. Now, if parents refuse to send their kids to these Indian schools, the military kidnapped them and forcibly enrolled them. Eventually, this whole program, the reservation program, and the forced assimilation is going to be replaced by something called the Dawes Act. And at first, the Dawes Act looks good because land is going to be set aside and given to Native populations. The government's going to help them learn about farming and private ownership. So it looks like a win-win. But in reality, the Native American populations are still being forced assimilated into Western culture. And the Dawes Act is actually going to take even more land away from Native populations than the reservation system did. In, I believe it's 1880, Native Americans had about 140 million acres worth of land. And by 1920, that's down to under 40 million. So not only does it take away nearly all native held land, but it wipes out native tribal customs. And it's not a good time for native life. A lot of Native American customs and beliefs and ways of life were lost at this time. Eventually there's going to be open resistance. Uh, you got the Nez Perce, who are one of the most famous of these resistance groups. In 1877, they try to flee to Canada. Uh, they leave from Wyoming and Montana. They travel northwest through Idaho, and they get within 50 miles of the border into Canada. The U.S. Army is chasing them the entire time. And when the U.S. Army finally cap catches up to them 50 miles from the Canadian border, uh, 
a battle happens. This battle goes on for five days. The U.S. Army eventually defeats the Nez Perce, and the Nez Perce are forced to march back to Wyoming to a reservation. Uh, you also have the Apache, led by Geronimo. Uh, yes, Geronimo was a real person, not just a phrase. Uh, Geronimo is going to organize this guerrilla warfare in the 1870s and the 1880s in places like Oklahoma and New Mexico. Eventually, Geronimo is going to be defeated by the U.S. Army in 1886, and the Apache people are going to be rounded up and sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. There's the ghost dance, and I hope you do take some time to watch this video right here of Sitting Bull's ghost dance. It's a recreation. Um, it's a nonviolent resistance, um, and it almost you could almost call it a religion. And the basic beliefs behind it were if all of the native people joined together and united as one, and if the ghost dance ritual was performed the right way, then white men could be destroyed. And people thought, including the government, that this was real. And so when groups of people got together to meet and do the ghost dance, it was broken up so the ghost dance couldn't be performed. And then probably the most famous thing is the Battle of Wounded Knee in 1890. Um, eventually, Sitting Bull, who is the most important Sioux chief was murdered at Standing Rock Reservation. It was a complete setup. Um, he was he was taken out of his house. He was arrested and then he was murdered right there while he was under arrest. Uh, the murder of Sitting Bull led members of the Sioux community to flee the Standing Rock Reservation. Um, three days later, the U.S. Army catches up with them at a place called Wounded Knee Creek. And the Sioux, including men, women, and children, are surrounded. They give up. And the U.S. Army, after these Sioux give up, are massacred. Over 250 Sioux are murdered by the U.S. Army. Now, uh, some other things to talk about, because you know, that was pretty depressing. Let's move on to settling the West. Um, you've probably seen some old Western movies or a Western TV show. You, you've probably got this image of tumbleweeds, saloons, bad guys, good guys, the shootout, the old K corral. It's not really true. The West was very sparsely populated. Native Americans and European Americans very rarely met. When they did meet, most of the, the interactions were good. Native Americans would often give white settlers food, water, shelter, tell them where to go. And overall, less than 5% of the deaths moving out west or associated with the west were a result of Native American encounters. In fact, death was primarily caused by disease. Cholera, uh, which is where you poop yourself to death for lack of better words, scarlet fever, starvation, accidents, all of that was more likely to kill you than Native Americans. Uh, there's a very famous phrase, if you've ever played the Oregon Trail, you died of dysentery. That's a common cause of death as well. And then there are over 20,000 documented deaths from disease, and there were many more that were undocumented. Now, who were these settlers? Most often they're miners. Silver's discovered in 1859. Gold in California is discovered in 1848. Settlers rush to Nevada and California to stake claims to gold fields and silver fields. Wherever those American miners went, they demanded protection from the military, so often the U.S. military followed. 
You also have some African Americans moving west. There are all black communities set up throughout the Great Plains. There are all black communities in Nebraska and Kansas. The most famous of them are the Buffalo Soldiers who were African American veterans of the Civil War. Uh, Hispanic people also live in the West already, but as more and more white settlers come, Hispanics are going to be segregated into increasingly poor areas. These white settlers are going to take the best jobs, best land, etc., etc. You also have some Chinese in the mix in California. The Chinese were brought over in the 1850s to work on the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. The Chinese people were brought in in the 1850s also to work for mining companies. But as more and more settlers come to the West, as more and more gold and silver is discovered, the Chinese are moved out of the mines. They're not allowed to become U.S. citizens. And in 1882, Chinese immigration is completely banned with the Chinese Exclusion Act. Now the last screen here, um, it's the Black Lodge Singers. It's a group from Washington State. They've got like 20 something records out and it's traditional music of, of um, Native Americans. It's drums and it's spoken word. And I highly encourage you to listen to this. It is the Black Lodge Singers rendition of the SpongeBob SquarePants theme song. Let me know if you like it. I'm interested in seeing what you have to have to say about it. Um, for this week, though, uh, you do have a quiz. You do have a discussion board. And there are three very interesting readings. There's a there's a letter by a gentleman named William Scrubby. William Scrubby was an immigrant from England who moved to Wisconsin. And it kind of is a short letter that he wrote back home. And in the letter, he just kind of tells about what he saw. There's also the 1880s diary that's written by Hetty Lou Anderson. And it talks about her experience moving to Nebraska and what she had to deal with. And then finally, there are some excerpts from a book called Black Elk Speaks. Nicholas Black Elk was a Sioux medicine man. Uh, he got to experience life with wild bills, traveling sideshow. Uh, he was relative to Sitting Bull. He was relative to Crazy Horse. It's a really, really good book. If you are looking for something to read, it's called Black Elk Speaks. I know for sure that it is in our West Georgia Tech library. I'm um, not going to make you read the whole book, but there are some excerpts that I want you to read. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. But as always, any questions, any concerns, anything that you need or anything I can help you with, feel free to email me and uh, stay safe and we'll see each other eventually. Bye-bye.